Uh -huh. So there is a homework due today. Don't walk away with your homework. Make sure you turn it in, okay? So um, I realized that our exam will be on Friday. Is that right? It's the Friday before Easter. It's called the, the Good Friday. So is it a good day to have the exam? Mm, yes. Mm -hmm. So is it um, desirable we do a little bit review on Wednesday? Yes. Half class though, not a whole class. Uh -huh. The package is there, okay, so we'll do that. That's okay. So speaking about Easter, I know it's not really um, a holiday here, but I spent, I told you spent time in Europe. That was like the second biggest holiday next to Christmas. I would like to share with you some, just some little interesting thing that happened to us. Um, two years ago at the Easter, my daughter was out biking in the neighborhood and she um, rescued a tiny little bunny. And actually a nest of bunny was attacked by crows and then she found all their siblings lying in a pool of blood and this poor little bunny was alive and she took it home saying, Mommy, we have to take care of this bunny. So we ended up raising up this bunny, I had a lot of fun, went to the shop and bought kitten substitute milk and forced the bunny to drink it. And the bunny survived and it grew first in the cage for hamster. And very soon, it's too big, it would not even fit in. So, and I got tired of going out to my lawn, pull out all dandelions. My lawn was almost dandelion free for about a couple of weeks. And then it got so big, I got tired of it, so I took it to campus. Do we all see bunnies hopping around happily in campus like a paradise? I actually went next to the McAllister building. <laughs> I opened the cage and took it out. It had no intention to go. And I say, go, get a degree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't know, maybe he has a PhD in math now. Who knows, that bunny. <laughs> Enough to keep you awake for a while? Okay, let's start. <laughs> okay, so last time we started a little bit. Uh -huh, we are talking about least squares method. Okay, so how much do we remember? We were last time, least squares method. So we were talking about this for continuous functions. So this is a little bit different. Did I turn it on? Yeah. Okay, so let me just put the setting up. So we are given a function f of x. Okay, so this we have already last time on the interval from a to b. And then we are given a set of basis functions gi, define on the same interval, okay, so we have all that. So we seek a function g of x, which we throw in this fancy term, that is a, a linear combination of all these basis functions, so ai, gi of x, where I have, um, <coughs> let's say I have um, n of these basis functions, okay, I want to do that. Seek this such that it best approximates, I'm sorry I use all these abbreviations, approximates the function f of x. So when I talk about best here, it's understood in the sense of the least squares. The arrow measured in this square sense shall be minimized. Okay. So we had that arrow. How did we measure the arrow? Well, arrow in the end becomes a function of these coefficients, a n, right? So you have all these from your notes from last time. Okay. So this, we measure it as the L2 distance between f and g. We want the L2 distance to be minimized, but then we don't want to deal with the square root sign, so we just consider the square of it. Okay, so if you remember, recall the definition. So this will be f x minus g x square dx. Okay, 
So you plug in the G as a linear combination, so you know that the error will actually de depend on those coefficients. Okay. So last time we we already computed at the minimal, we must have all these partial derivatives to be zero. It's a necessary condition, not sufficient though. But in this problem, it is okay because the way we define the error. Okay, and then we worked out the derivative, and in the end, we found out we have um, these equations. So let me copy. I have different. Um, index in my notes than what I did last time. So um, i from 1 to n, mm -hmm, integral, is that what we had last time? From a to b of a um, i g i x g j x dx. That's the left hand side. And the right hand side is a to b. So if I use j, I would have f of x, g, j of x, dx. Okay, so um, j runs from 1 to, to n. So basically, these give me n equations, right? That's where we stopped last time. So let's continue. So first, I want to rewrite these n equations because I realize that my unknown, these a vectors, they go in in a linear way. So I would like to express it in matrix vector form. We always do that, and then we solve it in MATLAB, right? Okay, so if I do that, so what I first will do will be I will um, exchange the order of integral and summation. It's a finite sum. We assume the functions are integrable, so I can switch it. After I switched, oh, I already switched, okay. I already switched it. It's OK. Originally, what we had last time was these were the other order. OK, so I switched it. And then now we realize this is a constant in x. It has nothing to do with x. I can take it out, out of the integral. OK, so that's, um, I'm going to write it again. So because in the end, that's the form that gives me a matrix in vector form. So g i. G, J. I'm going to drop the X to make it a bit shorter. It'll be F times G, J, DX. Okay. So this is the Jth equation. And then we see that this is the sum of all the A, I's and this expression for G, I. That reminds me of a vector in a product. Right? And we see we can write it as a matrix times a vector. Okay, so we have done that already quite a few times. So let's set this up. So in matrix vector form, how would that look like? I would say, let's say, let's call this matrix capital C. Mm -hmm. And uh, the unknown vector will be all these A's. Let's call this A vector. And then I have a right hand side B vector. Okay, are we okay? We just write this up for me. Okay, so what are the A vector? A vector will be just my unknown, AN, okay? And the B vector is the load vector. So if we denote BJ to be the Jth element, what will be the BJ? It will be just the right hand side. Is that OK? That, that we know. And then the C is the coefficient matrix. If we denote ij to be its element, and we know how to write each element, well, it will be exactly this thing that's multiplied with ai, the j's column. It's OK? So this will be integral from a to b gi times gj dx. So in principle now, um, we reduce the problem into ax equal to b. So I have been saying that almost every problem we run into in the end, we have to solve a system of linear equation. That's why it's so important, the system of linear equation, which we just covered. Okay. So 
At this point, you shall be worrying about um, this coefficient matrix C here. If you want to have a unique solution, you need to know if C is regular, right? It, it, it should have an inverse. It should be non-singular. Okay. So here is a piece of theorem which is stated without proof. Okay. So now if your basis function GIs, the set of basis function is linearly independent, Okay, so we had came across this concept in our ODE course earlier. Basically says one function cannot be represented as a linear combination of the other functions. Okay. So if if these functions they're all linearly independent of each other, then um, I know C is regular. So it just means it's invertible. It just means the whole system we are dealing with here, CA equals to B, has a unique solution. Okay. Okay, so that's like the minimal requirement to have a well-posed problem, but we could probably get the best possible scenario. You know, solving a system of linear equation takes time, and if you choose your um, basis function in a specific smart way, you can actually get a very easy system to solve. That's what we're going to look at now. Okay. So I introduced to you some concept that's called um, orthogonal. You might have come across this when you study vectors. The two vectors are orthogonal to each other. We will talk about functions orthogonal to each other. Okay. So we say that the basis function, the set of basis function, is a orthogonal set. So we call this an orthogonal base if the following is true. So in principle, I should introduce you to the inner product, but let's don't get too technical. So if the integral from A to B of g i x g j x dx equal to 0 for all i does not equal to j, meaning you take two different basis function, make the product and integrate on the interval you're studying, and the integral is zero, okay? And then we say this set of basis function is an orthogonal set. Is that clear? So why do you think I introduced that? Where does it go into in the end in the problem that I'm solving? What consequence will this have? We're trying to get uh, our uh, sorry, matrix entries that are zero, maybe in the diagonal matrix. Yes, you're two steps ahead. <laughs> you see, that's exactly what goes into this coefficient matrix C, right? So you see that C, I, J will be zero if I does not equal to J. So all the non-diagonal elements are zero, which means C is this capital C as a matrix is diagonal. So if it's diagonal, then it's super easy to solve, which means if you rewrite it out into equations, each equation has one unknown on the left-hand side, right? You can just solve it. Okay. So, so we can simply solve it. Solution becomes easy. You can just write out. So the diagonal element here, which can never be zero because basis functions are not zero. Okay, so a to b and g i square of x <coughs> dx. Say that's the diagonal element, and then your solution a i simply equals to because your equation number i will be c i i times a i equals to b i. Is that right? Just one equation. So this will be b i over c i i. That's it. Okay. So let me write this out. So it's from a to b f of x. Did I call it f of x? Yes. f of x g um, i of x dx over integral from a to b and g i square of x dx. 
so you can just write out your best approximation, your least square method solution. Yeah. So let's take a look at this A here. It's, it's kind of an important formula. And there is a way of, a quick way of memorizing it quickly. So AI is the coefficient in front of the basis function GI. Is that right? And it's computed as a fraction. On the numerator is the function you're approximating multiplied by that basis function integrated. Okay? And the denominator is that basis function square integrated. Is that clear? So you have AI standing in front of GI in your linear combination. Okay, so that's a quick way of remembering it. Are we okay? Any questions so far, sir? Our two functions that are orthogonal on the interval A to B, can those become um, not orthogonal in other? Of course. Really? Yeah. In, I mean, you take a different integral uh, interval? Yeah. Of course. <sighs> Think of, think of a function 1 and x. You multiply them, so this is your g1, this is your g2. Are we okay? You multiply them, you get x. You integrate from negative 1 to 1, it's 0. Yeah. What about you integrate it from 0 to 2? It's not 0. Yeah. Clear? It's important what interval you're talking about. Okay. Okay, so it's exactly because of this powerful observation that orthogonal bases decompose these equations. And that's why these orthogonal functions in the history of mathematics have been extensively studied. So I will introduce you to two families of these orthogonal functions. Okay, I don't know if you have heard of them. Maybe, maybe not. So the first one is this family of function called um, Legendre polynomials, so all these basis functions in the end become polynomials here. So I don't know. Have we heard about this? Legendre polynomial? Any Frenchy here? I'm sorry, I always joke about the French, but mm. no hard feelings. <laughs> they are great. <laughs> I don't know, first class I remember there was a girl who spoke French and she disappeared. <laughs> okay. So these are polynomials. I don't know if you have taken other ODE courses. If you have taken the 400 level ODE courses, then you know these polynomials are actually solutions of something called the Legendre equation, okay? It's an eigenvalue problem. Okay, there's a big theory. If you want me to talk about it, we can spend the rest of the semester going over that. But let's just take what's relevant here. So these are solutions of a whole um, a polynomial uh, of Legendre equation. So let me give you these polynomials. These are the polynomials like this. So P0, there are a whole family of them, infinitely many of them actually. P0 is 1, P1 is x, and P2 will be um, 3x squared minus 1 over 2. And let me do one more, p3. You can easily Google it and find many. There's a table, minus 3x um, over 2. So this is uh, the Legendre polynomial defined on the interval from negative 1 to 1. If it's a different interval, they might take different forms. Okay. And there are many, many. And each of them, pk, you see, it's a polynomial of degree exactly k. Okay? You increase the degree by 1, you can generate a new um, Legendre polynomial. So what's so remarkable about these polynomials, if you know they are solutions of eigenvalue problems, so they, are, they will be called eigenfunctions, and you know they're orthogonal if you have taken that course. If not, it's OK, no panic. Okay? So let's take an example as to verify this fact. Example one, so let's verify that, let's take three of them, P0, P1, P2, okay? A set of these three functions, okay, is an orthogonal set. Is that okay? So basically I have to show three product, P0, P1, P1, P2, P0, P2, 
You have three functions, I integrate them from zero to one, I shall get zero, right? That's what I have to show, okay? So let's take some shortcuts, which is very useful here. So let's look at P0, let's use even and odd property. Is this an even function or odd function? Are we comfortable talking about even functions and odd functions? An even function will be symmetric about y-axis. Is that right? So this is even. And what about P1? Is it symmetric about the y-axis, the graph of this function? How does it look like? It's like this. Oops, it goes through the origin. So it's symmetric about the origin, right? So the official definition is if you have this, that's odd. And if you have this, and that's even. But um, geometrically, it's symmetric about origin, then it's an odd function. Are we OK? So this is odd. I mean, if you are fluent with this, the observation is quick. So what about P2? Is this even or odd? If you put negative x in it, will it change the value? So it's even. Mm -hmm. What about the product? So P0 times um, P1, you multiply even with an odd, what function do you get in the end? It's like even is negative, odd is positive. If you multiply negative with positive, what do you get? So it's odd, right? Even times odd gives you odd function, and then P, um, P1 times P2 will also be odd. Is that right? Okay, but P0 times P2 will be even function. Even times even is even. Okay, so why do I bother checking that? Because I know in the end, I have to integrate from negative 1 to 1, P0 times P1 dx. And then I say, well, if you say this is odd, and that's 0, nothing I need to do. Why can I say that? Any comments? Mm -hmm. Separate the integral. Into the negative half and the positive half. So odd function is symmetric about x x uh, origin. So whatever graph it takes up here, it will take the same graph, but down here, right? And you integrate it, the area here will equal to the area here, but with opposite signs. So exactly cancels. Is that clear? Okay, so that makes, makes life easier if you have these quick shortcuts. Okay, so P1, P2 will be zero. So you already nail down two, and then the last one you only need to verify will be between P0 and P2. Okay. And since B, P0 is just one, this is not so hard to compute. So let's put in the P2. That's 3x squared minus 1 and over 2 dx. It's just a polynomial. So. Let's be quick and work this out. So it's a half x cubed minus x evaluated at negative 1 to 1, right? So you put in 1, you get 0. You put in negative 1, you get 0. OK? So we, we are convinced that that's um, a set of orthogonal functions. OK, now we can try to um, approximate functions with these basis. <laughs> okay, so okay, so find a function. We're going to use only those three linear combination of them. So gx equals to c0 p0, c1 p1, c2 p2. To best, okay, let's put the best. You know what I mean by best? To best approx approximate a function f of x. So I'm going to throw in um, some function that's not even continuous. 
So on the interval from negative 1 to 0, it's negative 1. And on the interval from 0 to 1, it's 1. Is that OK? So it has a jump at x equal to 0. So you know, if I try to approximate this with those three polynomials, no matter how you um, choose your constant c1, uh, c0, c1, c2, it's never going to be a discontinuous function, right? So you can just try to approximate as best as you can. So, okay, best means in least square error. Okay, so let's sketch this function f here. 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1. So it's 1 here and it's negative 1 here. Is that right? Okay. Okay, so, well, it's actually not that much to do because we already did the hard work. We showed the so three functions are orthogonal, and then by the analysis we have done here, all we need to do is plug in and work out the coefficients. The formula is right here. Is that okay? So, let's write out. So, what will these CIs be? CI will sim simply equal to um, on the numerator, the integral negative 1 to 1 of fx multiply with whatever function ci is standing in front of the basis function, so pi x dx, and the denominator is that basis function square dx. Is that right? So i equals to 0, 1, 2. I just need to work out these three numbers. And, okay, let's play the game of even and odd again to just cut down the computation. So look at the function of f here. Is this even or odd? Does it happen to be a, is this symmetric about y-axis? Is this symmetric about origin? So it's, it's odd, isn't it? Right? So if f is odd, and then I know if f multiplied by any p that p is even, I'm going to get an odd function. Agree? And we know p0, p2, they are even, right? So this tells me that p, um, f times p0 and f times p2 are going to be odd functions. So what does it mean? The numerator is going to be 0 for c0 and c2. Is that right? So nothing you need to do. C0 equals to C2 equals to 0. So you just need to figure out C1. Okay, let me continue here. So what is C1? So only need to compute C1. So C1 becomes, well, we have the formula. It will be f times P1. So I actually have an odd function multiplied by an odd function, which becomes an even function. So you integrate it symmetrically around the origin. Well, it's going to be the same on the left and on the right. Agree? So you just need to multiply by 2 and integrate just one side. Is that OK? fx times P1 of x dx and integrate now is negative 1 to 1. I can also do the same trick, but let's let's just leave it there. Are we okay? Because I do this because f is piecewise defined, otherwise I have to break it into two integrals. Okay? So putting the numbers, this is 1, this is x dx, and down here I get negative 1 to 1 x squared dx. Two simple integrals to work out. Okay, So when I see this integral, I see the area of a triangle. Do we see that? It's half, right? Half times 2 is 1. And this is, well, 1 third x cubed at negative 1 to positive 1 gives you 2 thirds. And the whole thing is 3 over 2, so it's 1.5. Okay? It's just integrals. Okay, So you can say now, my best <coughs> choice is the following, gx simply equal to 1.5 times x. 
that is the closest you can get to this function using only these three basis functions and make linear combinations of them. Is that okay? All right. So that's one family um, using um, polynomials. Next, we'll be going into trig functions. So, um, oh, I thought I asked this before. How many of us have taken 251? Matt. <laughs> yes. Have we heard about Fourier series? Sine, cosine? Yes. Right, okay. So, I'll be talking about trig set. If you have heard of Fourier series, and then you, you feel very comfortable. Otherwise, you just join the right. So the trig set is the set of following functions. So I will take constant function 1, and then I will take all the sine functions and all the cosine functions. Okay, And then these n um, runs from 1 to all the way. Infinitely many. Okay, so you see there are infinitely many functions in this set. And right now I'm defining this set on the interval from negative pi to pi. So you see on this interval, each of these sine and cosine functions, they are periodic. They complete exactly n periods. Right? Okay. What more, we'll know that this trig set is an orthogonal set, meaning the um, integral of two distinct functions in the set, product of it, integrate from negative pi to pi is zero. Okay? So if you have taken Fourier series, then you are familiar with that computation. So let me list out these properties. So what does it mean that is orthogonal? That means I have the following. So if I take any sine function multiply with 1, these are two distinct basis functions, I'll get 0, 1 times sine mx dx. That will be 0, and the same thing happens if I do cosine. So I, can, I don't have to write the 1. Okay? And that holds for all n, each n. And then if I look at the set of all sine functions, if I take two distinct sine functions, so sine nx and sine mx dx, where m and n are different, that's going to be 0. The same thing happens if I do two different cosine functions. So these are zero um, for distinct ones. So for all, n does not equal to m. Okay, and then um, any sine and cosine. That's the last one. Any combination will give me zero. Okay, so that's for all n and m. Even they equal to each other. So I will leave it as a homework for you to verify. There's nothing more than just work out this integral, which you can do after you have taken calculus. It's just a simple sine-cosine integration. Then you'll be convinced of this fact. Is that OK? Are we OK? <sighs> we accept it. You can go ahead and verify it. All right. And we'll use this fact to form something. Okay, so um, next example, number three. Okay, so I'm going to give a given a big number, m, that's just a big positive number, and, and then I will approximate a function fx on this, defined on the interval negative pi to pi with the with the following function. So I call it g. And so it will be a linear combination of all these trig functions where I let n run from 1, 2, all the way to the capital M. 
it's kind of I just chop it off and throw away infinitely terms, but just keep the first kind of n terms. Okay? So one function is a constant, so I multiply by c0, okay? And then all the signs, so I have a summation, so n from 1 to m. So what's in front of sine, I call it a n, sine n x. And for the cosine, well, call it b, okay? So finitely many functions, and my goal is to choose suitable coefficients so that this g gets as close as possible to this function f. Is that clear? Best possible. Okay? In best possible way. So you know what I mean by best possible. Okay, so now this is in the same setting as what we have been talking about, except that I wrote this in this way, maybe it's confusing you. I kind of group the basis functions into kind of a three category. I list the function one alone, and I group the sine functions together, right? And I group the cosine functions, and I call these coefficients b. You can think, say, that's g0, uh, that's the constant function, and then you have g1, g2, g3, gn for the sine function, all the way to gm, then gm plus 1, gm plus 2, all the way to g2m for the cosine. You can write it like that as well. Is that okay? But I just group them because that's the notation, okay, that's being used to something that we're trying to reach. Okay. So we know now already, we accept the fact this is an orthogonal set, so I can actually write out these coefficients right away, isn't it? How do I write out these coefficients? So let's see, how do I write out a n? Can someone help me? What was our observation when we write out the coefficient here on the numerator? It is the f multiplied by the basis function where this coefficient stands in the front, right? And the denominator, denominator is that basis function square integrated, isn't it? That's the same here. Okay, so for a n, now tell me what will be on the numerator. So negative pi to pi, I will integrate f multiply with what? Which function does a n stand in the front with? A sine, is that right? So sine nx dx and the denominator will be that function squared, right? So sine squared and x dx. Is that okay? So bn can be written out in a totally similar way. So let's write it. Negative pi to pi fx cosine nx dx and integral negative pi to pi cosine squared nx dx. All right, um, the last one, the C0. So what will be on the numerator? Mm -hmm. Negative pi to pi, fx, multiply with the basis function that C0 stand in the front, which is C0 stands alone. That means C0, excuse me, is multiplied by one, right? That's. That's the first function in my trig set. It's that function. So it's just multiplied by 1. So I have that. And then the denominator will be 1 squared, which is still 1 dx. Okay? So this actually gives me 1 over 2 pi of negative pi to pi fx dx. So if you are a keen observer, you know the C0 becomes the average value of f on the interval from negative pi to pi. Okay, I should not get carried away. We could spend the rest of the semester talking about these orthogonal <laughs> functions. Okay, so make this observation now. 
if I let this capital M grow bigger and bigger and let it go to infinity, what do we get? We get a series, don't we? So this now becomes infinity, and that's the famous Fourier series. Okay? So this gives the Fourier series. So in many math courses, you will learn about Fourier series, I think, 405. Um, many. There is a course just dedicated to Fourier analysis. Is that 412? I think it's just on that. It has huge applications. Okay. Any questions? Are we OK? This is a little bit different from our regular courses dealing with indexes and algorithms. Mm -hmm. A little bit abstract today. Any questions? We okay? Didn't put any of you to sleep? Mm -hmm. Not yet? <laughs> All right, then we say goodbye to least square method and we go into something really exciting. We just do a very soft um, introduction here. Basically, I just throw some names at you. Okay. So, what we will be doing next for the rest of the semester, usually at the end is the highlight, and usually you don't have time and you rush through. Let's don't repeat that mistake. So, I will be talking about numerical solutions of ordinary differential equations. So I will be writing ODEs. Okay, so that stands for ordinary differential equations. Okay. So I know very few of us have taken 250 or 251. Just a, a couple of us have done that. So don't worry about it. Okay. If you have taken it, it just makes you more comfortable looking at these equations. To start with, I will start with saying that whatever they learn in 250, 251 is totally use. <laughs> okay, should not say that. It's useless because they can only solve specific equations, very few of them. For most of the equations written in a general form, there is not a method that allow you to write down what the solution will be. So in practice, you still want a solution of those equations. What do you do? You use some numerical methods and you can find an approximate solution. Right, so that's what we'll be doing here. So if you have not taken 250, no panic. Is that okay? Just want you to feel comfortable about it here. Okay, so what is an ordinary differential equation? Well, you want a silly mm, definition, just like English definition, ODE. That will be some equation containing the derivatives of the unknown, right? So if your unknown is u, as a function of x, so it will contain u prime or u double prime also. Okay, so ux is your unknown. So, um, some silly examples. Well, not really very meaningful. So, let's say x of t is my unknown. I can write y of x as my unknown. I can write it in many ways. My unknown shall be a function of one variable, so the derivatives are ordinary derivatives. Okay. Later on, we'll have functions depend on two variables, and then we'll look at some PDEs. Okay. There'll be partial derivatives. Okay. Some perspective. Okay. So, let's say I can have x squared, x prime equal to x squared. Those of you who have taken 250 nodes, you can separate the variable and solve it, right? <laughs> but what if I write it a little bit more nasty? Then it's not so simple. I can throw in something, and that's another ODE, second order, and it's nonlinear because x is multiplied with itself in some form, right? So in general, constructing an exact solution is really hard, okay? Um, what we will do here in this numerical approximation, we are not really finding um, the unknown as a function. 
So what we will be doing will be um, we kind of a generate a grid. So okay, let me write out the setting. So the setting of the problem we will be considering is the following. So I should write it out. It will be nicer. So what we'll be considering is something called initial value problem. Hi. So later on, I will be writing I, V, P. Is that OK? Initial value problem. OK. So the problem is the following. x prime as a function of t is given as a function of t and x. So I will be able to write my differential equation in this form, for example. And we have initial time, call it t0, and x at t0 is given. Okay? And this is called the initial condition. So some terminology so you know later on we'll just talk about it. Okay. So initial conditions very often I will just write I C. Is that okay? Okay, so make it a bit quicker to talk about things. Okay. Okay, and uh, what we will do will be we will not actually find um, a function, we will find approximations only at um, discrete points of time t. Okay, so we will find approximations. We'll denote this by x k, which an, is an approximation of the solution's value at t k and k from 0, 1, 2, all the way to n. So this means I select a kind of a, we call it a grid, a sample point for these t's, okay, so I will have this grid t0 less than t1 less than t2 all the way to the last one, tn, and that's the final computational time, then I will stop there. Okay. I will find approximate values to the solution at these points, and then you know in MATLAB you can plot them against each other and then you can see the graph. Provided those t's are close enough, you can have a nice graph representing the solution. Is that okay? And in most of the discussion here, we will use uniform grid. I know these terminologies, once you get used to them, they're in your head, and then they're there automatic. So let me introduce to you. So uniform grid meaning I will be spacing these points, t, in a uniform way. That is, if I look at tk plus 1 minus tk, the distance between the two neighboring t, it equals to h. h does not depend on k, and it's a fixed parameter. Is that okay? So that's a uniform grid. And if that is the case, then I can simply write out my tk, which will be t0 plus k times h. Is that okay? And then um, next time we will start talking about um, real methods that can be used to generate these solutions. Which means Wednesday, which means I promise you a review, so we have only half a 